The I More Show is brought to you today by SoftLayer. SoftLayer delivers a cloud built for innovation. SoftLayer is an IBM company. In fact, IBM uses SoftLayer as its cloud infrastructure foundation for all IBM cloud products and services. Even if you're not looking for infrastructure, you can benefit from SoftLayer infrastructure when you use platform or software services for IBM cloud. Now, here's what you can do. You can have the opportunity to get $500 of cloud infrastructure by visiting softlayer.com slash podcast. That's softlayer.com slash podcast. Thank you, Softlayer. Thank you, IBM. Here's the iMore Show. Hey, everyone. It is September 14, 2015. I'm Renee Ritchie, and right now we're going to do a complete post-game wrap-up on Apple's September event. This is the iMore Show. Joining me today, we have freshly returned from San Francisco, Serenity Caldwell. How are you, Ren? I'm doing all right. Um, I'm excited that it is cold on the East Coast right now. So I'm wearing a sweater. It's it's kind of weird, especially after our 90 degree uh, night adventure on the West Coast. We were in the event, and people were like, "I'd rather the Wi-Fi go down than the air conditioning." It was amazing. Also joining us, we have Georgia Dow. How are you, Georgia? I'm good. I'm good. I'm also wearing a sweater. It's cold here as well. It's like air conditioned. It was a heat wave before, and now someone finally found the air conditioning switch. I'm so happy. So we're going to get right to it because the event was uh, a chock-a-block full of stuff. But first, I'm going to tell you about one of our quick sponsors, and that is... uh, See, this happens sometimes. They've, they've done this twice now. I click on the link to get soft layer, and instead of soft layer, I get something else. So I will fix that in post, and we're going to get right into the show. So, uh, Ren, it started off with, you know, Tim Cook came out, but then we immediately went to the watch, and the watch was once again hosted by um, Jeff Williams. Now, the watch is under Jeff Williams' organization. It's not under... It is. Yeah, it's not under like the product organization. It's in the special projects under Jeff Williams. He did a stage before for Research Kit, I feel like. Yeah, so what did you think? What did you think of Jeff Williams doing the watch, like instead of Angela Ahrens or Phil or somebody else? Well, I'm still frustrated that Angela Ahrens has not made an appearance on stage, despite the fact that she has quite a bit of stage experience. And I've kind of, it's like, you have a wonderful woman in your in your VP who does great things with stage work. But at the same time, Jeff Williams really has been the public face for the Apple Watch. And I imagine, you know, it's that's Apple that's Apple public procedure. They, they pick one of their VPs to be the public face of a product. And then that VP is pretty much the public face of that product for, you know, a, a, a while, to say the least. Um, Jeff Williams is not as charismatic as Craig Federighi on stage, but he's doing a great job and he's getting better every time he is on stage. I thought it was very funny. Um, he's like, I'm going to be so excited about pink Apple Watches, you guys. And Hermes bands. Like, Angela could have done Hermes yeah, bands, Hermes I feel like. Hermes bands, yes. Oh, my gosh. I want to I wanna wear one of these. So <laughs> little, he, did a, he did a good job. Little known, little known fact, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this or not, but our, our, our dear leader, Kevin Michalik, has an Hermes leather band. And I thought it always cost an obscene amount of money. And then I actually went and looked at Hermes. And it's, it's pretty much what you think it is. It is an obscene amount of money for leather and fabric. Yes. Uh, and I guess th- that sort of fits in, right, Ren? Like you have the edition and then you have the watch, and this is sort of sliding in in between, like a high fashion watch brand. Yeah, this is a uh, this is for people who want the high fashion experience, but don't necessarily want to pay ten thousand dollars for a gold watch. I believe the Hermes collection starts at fifteen or sixteen hundred dollars and goes all the way up to nineteen hundred dollars. So there's a there's this weird sort of nice midpoint for people who maybe want something as classy as the Link Band. Um, the Apple Watch, but not necessarily want something so flamboyantly uh, expensive as a solid gold Apple Watch. Yeah, and then uh, they had uh, the gold and rose gold, Georgia, which I knew that you'd had your eye on for a while. I do. I love them. I love the gold. I love the rose gold. I, I think that if I was, like, I, I love my black watch face, and I think that I would stick with it, but the rose gold watch face, I know, Serenity, you saw it, it was like just, like it's so pretty, and with a pink band, it's just absolutely adorable. (laughs) Although we really have to say, it's not so much rose gold as it is pink gold. 
I feel like that there's a very different. <laughs> they're they're calling it rose gold, but that is not what I think of when I think of rose gold. Uh, yes, product. it is. It is much closer to pink than it is to like a bronzy kind of a rose gold color. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, so what was interesting to me, and we'll get to this later too, is that Apple is sort of being fearless in, because there's this perception that gold is gold, and now people who might have lusted after gold but said there's no way I'm paying 1200 you know, sorry, $12,000, $17,000 for a watch, can get them at the price of a sport, which is like $350, $400, and they don't really care that that might be seen as undercutting the value of the gold gold or, or real rose gold watch. And I kind of like that Apple. That's always the Apple that, I, that I'm happy about. And it, it has a beautiful look to it. I love that it's like like a lot of people like the brushed metal look. And so I think that it has a toned down look to it that I actually like better than the gold watch look to it. But I think that it just brings the watch to everyone. Like there are certain people that really don't like the fact that the watch didn't come in different colors that they wear. So if you wear a lot of gold, it makes sense that you would want a gold watch. Very few people can afford to spend $17,000 for a watch. Yeah, and we got new straps, and this is the interesting part to me, is that it, well, I'm increasingly getting the feeling that the straps are where the investment is going to be. Like, Saturday and I have an indecent, frankly, an indecent amount of straps, but I'm not too worried because I figure Watch 2 is going to work with them, and then just buying that core every year isn't as bad because I can keep using the straps. Yeah, I I have got to assume that they're not going to invalidate the strap market anytime soon. I mean, we've seen Apple change their cases before, but I do feel like watch bands are a bit more of an investment than your average sixty dollar case. Um, th there's a lot more there's a lot more definitive thinking towards it. I, I think that that's the lie that we tell ourselves. We're like, ah, oh, you know, it's okay to buy another watch band because, <laughs> you know, it, they'll work with the other watch and I might want to change them. And so we get to kind of like accessorize. But I think in the end, people love to accessorize. This is a fashion accessory. So it's like buying shoes, it's buying a strap, it's buying new glasses. Well, glasses can be kind of expensive, but it's something that you get to wear different straps. And I will probably buy, I will continue to buy more watch bands knowing that I really will only keep on using the one that I like the best. <laughs> uh, unless it's for like a special occasion it's where like I like Klingons. Wear... They've, got a, they've got a kill to be George's one and only chosen watch band. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I think that it's smart. If I'm going out and I'm wearing a certain outfit in a certain color, I do think to myself, which watch band is going to look good with this? And it would stop me. Sometimes I would not wear my Apple Watch because... It does, the band doesn't fit with, or the watch itself didn't fit well with what my outfit was wearing. And so I wouldn't wear it at all, which made me really sad. So, you know, even buying a secondary watch, that's a benefit. Yeah, but Ren, there were so many new bands. Like, I thought there'd be a couple, like maybe a product red, but they have two-tone leather. And then, I, I don't know how many, six or something, new sport bands? Yep, I mean, they've, they've basically filled in the color gaps on the sport bands. There are a lot of off-white uh, variations of the sport bands, including a taupe, a gray, um, the more subtle, less pastel-y colors, uh, for, which I think was a, a big demand when people first initially saw the bands. Where they're like, I like the blue, but couldn't it be a little bit darker? Now there's a midnight blue sport band, which I will almost certainly be getting. Um, <laughs> there are... It, I feel like they're just, they are expanding the lineup to fit more day-to-day -day activities for people who would really like to wear an Apple Watch but maybe don't want the price investment of something like a modern buckle, yeah. which is still my favorite. Still and they my made favorite the, watch band. To, to, speaking to that, they made the uh, black um, stainless steel available with a sport band, and I believe you can buy the black link bracelet separately now too, so that's a lot mm -hmm. of sort of the lust pressure now, taken yeah. off. Yeah. Interesting times. And we have Watch OS 2 that's coming on the 16th. It's not a huge deal. It's not like iOS 9. It's more of a rounding out of all the features. But uh, I know at least Serenity and I have been using it for a while, and, and it, it does make it a more complete, more har harmonious experience. It really does. It really does. And I'm, I'm very happy that they took this step to really round out the watch experience. Yeah, I'm super happy about that as well. Uh, transitioning quickly, actually, before we transition, I'm going to go into a, a real Addy ad uh, for a second because I'm historically really bad about remembering to do them, so I'm trying to force myself. So the iMore Show is brought to you this week by FanDuel. FanDuel is fantasy football. It's open now. Uh, the problem with fantasy football historically is that you were either in or you were out, and it was a whole season commitment. And... Um, 
with FanDuel, you can just sign up, play for a week, and then if you're busy the week after, busy for the two weeks after, that's fine. No commitment. You don't have to be there. If you come back a week later, you can go right back into it. Uh, and because football is a game, you know, it's it doesn't have as many games as there are in baseball or in hockey or as in other sports. It means that all the games they do have matter, and if you're involved with that, you can have uh, just a huge amount of fun. So if you go to FanDuel, you'll see it's the leader in one-week fantasy football with more winners and more payouts than any other site. They are paying out over $75 million a week this football season. Building a team is easy. You just pick your player, stay under the salary cap, sit back on Sunday, and watch your team win. Entry fees start at just $1, and anybody can play. Uh, now, I am, again, Canadian, so I am just beginning to understand the intricacies of American football. I mean, I watch the Super Bowl, uh, not just for the ads, but that's because this is big, you know, gladiatorial event. But I'm starting to understand why you have, for example, four downs instead of three. Did I just blow all the Americans' minds? I'm not sure. But this is a great way to learn about that kind of stuff as well. Um, you can build your own team for a week. You you, you can uh, use your Twitter handle. You can build squads. You can build teams. It's, it's, it's really a lot of fun. So what I want you to do is go to FanDuel.com and click on the microphone in the upper right-hand corner. Use the code IMORE and sign up. As a special offer to new users, every dollar you deposit in FanDuel will be matched up to $200 that gets earned as you play. So if you go in there and you put in $20, bucks, $50, bucks, $100, they will give you that much over the course of your, of your playing the game. Uh, and that's for the first 50 people that use promo code IMORE. So don't forget, use that code, FanDuel.com. Every day is a new season, F-A-N-D-U-L-E, sorry, D-U-E-L.com. Sign up today. All right, so next up, we had Tim Cook come back and talk about how the iPad was the clearest example of where Apple believed the future of technology lies. And then he introduced the iPad Pro. We've, it's been rumored for a long time. It's basically a 12.9-inch iPad, monstrously powerful, and Phil Schiller came out to show us the details. And the minute they showed the Apple Pencil, I heard Serenity uh, just demanding to buy one immediately. <laughs> I think my my immediate uh, thing was a well-deserved, finally! <laughs> Followed a list of, here are, the th here are all of the things I need you to test in the hands-on area, Renee. Because and I did. It's vitally important. No, I am, you did. You yeah. did. I am thrilled. I am absolutely thrilled that Apple has taken this step. I've wanted them to for pretty much since the iPad's inception uh, because I am a longtime Wacom user. I'm a longtime digital drawer. I like working um, on digital, uh, digital machines for art. Uh, but it has always been with a caveat or a compromise. Um, for a long time, I used the Intuos series of Wacom, which just requires on basically drawing on a, a flat surface with no screen and hoping that it will attribute properly on your computer. When the iPad came out, uh, it was basically the, the hope of like, oh, I could have a low-cost Cintiq. Because at that point, Wacom Cintiqs were in the $2,000 range. Um, and and let alone not portable. And the iPad, you know, the iPad fulfilled some of those desires, but was wasn't quite precise enough to really be for pro level artists. We've seen people do some really amazing things with the iPad and the iPad Air 2 and all of the sort of in betweens. Uh, people people who are fantastic artists can do really really amazing stuff uh, with third party styluses and with their fingers uh, because they they have a command of the craft. But this allows them to take a step further. Um, and a lot of people, of course, have been comparing the iPad Pro to the Microsoft Surface, which definitely it has its comparisons. Um, the, the really interesting thing for me for the iPad Pro will be to test it, test its pressure sensitivity and just general responsiveness with a Surface and also with a Cintiq companion, which is their line of portable Cintiqs. The iPad has sort of, uh, the iPad has the edge for me because A, it works with all of the apps that I know and love. B, it has the backbone of apps like Astropad, which allow you to mirror with no lag your iPads, uh, whatever you're working on your iPad to your Mac and vice versa, so that I can work in Photoshop with my iPad and not see any visible lag. And C, the lag and the um, duration of the pencil itself on the iPad screen, from demonstrations and from videos, that looks to be almost non-existent, which is incredible. The current lag time uh, for the iPad Air 2 on third-party styluses is something like a few milliseconds, and it's very noticeable. 
um, and very difficult to get a precise pinpoint accuracy well, of drawing. They're doing something super clever here. Like the one advantage you have is that there's no, like Wacom is a layer that goes in between you and the pixel. So you're almost like drawing on a buffer, which is not a buffer, but like a, an air gap, which is which is never optimal. No. But, they're also because they they have so they have double the scan lines in the iPad and then they have the force touch technology in or 3D touch whatever you want to call it now in the tip of the pen but they're also doing a bunch of telemetry in the pen like tilt like position and they're measuring all this the response rate I tried everything I tried cross hatching I tried signing my name I tried writing in script and they're also it, and I have to double check this with Apple, but it looked like they're actually predicting where you're going so they can keep it super fast. Because a couple times, I swear, I, I did like an odd turn, and it took a second and then redrew it live as I was continuing to draw. So mm -hmm. without losing, uh, losing like, you remember like when Safari, you, you would go too fast and it would take a second to, like it would never stop you, but it would take a second to catch up? The scroll, yep. Yeah, this is even better than that because like it still has, you never, like you never leave the ink behind, which is, you know, our experience on, on other styluses. It's always right there. Once in a while, it'll correct while it's going. But uh, I used a Wacom tablet for 10 years when I worked in design, and this was better than any of the Wacoms I'd ever used. And it's purpose-built for iOS, yeah, but uh, using um, Procreate uh, and using Apple's Notes app and using, you know, just a bunch of the third-party software, uh, I think we're going to be delighted, Ren. That's my quick take on it. Like I just, I could not beat that thing, and I tried hard. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really, really pumped to be able to do some more hands-on testing with it. Uh, hopefully, when it, when it comes out. And yeah, for those, for those who are like, oh well, it's not as good as you know. How can you say that it's just a Surface clone, or it's just, it will never be as good? You know what? The right tool for your workflow. If you really like the Surface and the iPad Pro is not interesting to you, that's okay. But for people who work primarily on Macs and who interact a lot with Macs, um, having an Apple-branded tablet, professional tablet, um, that allows you to work with a pressure-sensitive stylus, that's going to be huge for a certain yeah. subset of the market. And if, it's that, and if that's you, you are most likely really excited about this announcement. I'll go so far to say that not having Windows on this is a huge benefit to me because I still believe that Apple building iOS from the ground up for this kind of experience is better than trying to. I, I wish Microsoft had taken Windows Phone and built that out for the Surface or maybe stuck with Windows RT or something and made made something for this device because to me like not having legacy like I, I would not want OS 10 on this I know people do want that but it's just it was never designed for it nope nope Georgia you got your big wish in that you finally got usable speakers on an iPad <laughs> I did I wanted to say something about the stylus because um, I've always used a stylus I really enjoy using a stylus from all my palm days I'm like sad when I didn't have to use a stylus so I think that it's a wonderful thing for people. I think that if you have really large hands, using your finger as a stylus is a detriment because you can't exactly see where you're moving around on the screen. And that can be really difficult. When I'm playing various games, it's much easier to use a stylus. And so I often have to try to find a stylus. And all of them had fat tips on the ends. And so this is beautiful. And you can make detailed work with seeing the screen at the same time. And for people that have long nails or might have difficulties in mobility, this is also another way in which they can interact with the screen. So I'm so excited about that. Yeah, it's uh, it, it really is transformative. Like it felt like the other thing that was important is a lot of styluses don't feel like pens to me. Right. This had the weight of like somewhere between an HB pencil. And I never know if Americans use HB pencils or not, but it looks like an HB pencil. Okay. Uh, and a yep. um, a pen and like it, it had the weight and the feel another thing I have problem with styluses is, is they're slippery like they feel like they're sliding along the glass where this had drag and it wasn't paper texture drag but it was drag that felt real to me but I'm gonna lose it Renee like there's nowhere that I'm gonna be able to put I need to have like some way of like a locate my stylus or locate my, like my stylus pencil. I have yeah. to have that on my watch or something else because I'm going to lose it. There's no place to put it unless it's being charged. And so, like, you know, we don't want it to go. Mommy, this off. pen doesn't work right. See? Right. I don't, know about, I don't know about that because I've had styluses, again, for the past 10 years, if we include my Wacom tablets. And, like, I, I know where my stylus Like, if you take good care of it, it's like taking good care of, like, a Montblanc pen or something. Yeah, you see, well, that's, you have that's to, not me. <laughs> 
five children. They move things. They're like, ooh, look at this. And there's suddenly like, nope. it's gone. There's no, it's going to be stuck in the couch or somewhere else. I'm going to have to buy another one that I'm going to find the first one. I, they need to find a way of locating it no matter where it is. And then I'm happy. Or like find some magnetic way that it kind of like sticks to the iPad. Uh, that's what I'm going to use, duct tape. <laughs> Make a little duct tape holder. Right. Stick it on the back of your headboard cover. It'll what they've ever done is like field, like, like just had like a binding, like a spiral binding that you could put a pencil into, like old day, uh, old notebook. Right, a little tiny clip, but then the clip breaks off. So, George, I was trying to set you up for the speaker here because that's been your epic rant for years. And what they've yeah. got is now four speakers that are like three times louder than standard <laughs> iPad speakers. And as you rotate the screen, they rebalance everything perfectly. I, I tried them out. I, I was amazed at how well they sound. I, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Um, and it's funny because I don't use it. my iPads are like, you know, it's a graveyard of iPads because I don't charge them. I'm so excited for the new iPad Pro because of that. Because even when I was listening to the keynote on my air, I could barely hear it. And then they're talking about really loud sound. I'm like, this is epic. I'm so excited. Because if you're going to be playing a game, you want to be able to hear it. If you're going to listen to music, Oh, the this games are amazing, Georgia. I tried a couple of them. Magnificent. And, and if you're just watching a movie, then you really like stereo sound. So this is going to be phenomenal. Uh, yeah, no, I was super happy with it. The keyboard, I only got a few minutes with the keyboard. It felt like the MacBook keyboard to me. But the most exciting thing about the keyboard is that they're letting third parties immediately, like Logitech announced, I think, the same day. So that if you don't like Apple's take with, with their, uh, I forget what those new switches are called. Don't, the, the dome technology on those new switches. If you don't like those, you'll have Logitech and other sort of keyboards. But the idea that for some people, some people want more of a computer than an iPad. Now they have the MacBook, which is super light, but still a Mac. And some people want more tablet than laptop, and they can get the Mac, the, the iPad Pro. And it's it's more iPad than Mac, but it's still you can you can put the keyboard on and fill that need. Now, Renee, the keyboard is that keyboard also the case, and it yes, just kind of flips it, over, and then it's nice and seamless and protected. Uh -huh. Yep. Well, mostly seamless. There's yeah. a little bit of hump. For the <laughs> a little keys. bump on the edge? Still yeah. It sounds pretty good. And so it stays closed, and I don't have to worry about it opening up or anything being scratched. I was super happy with that. And just in general, the games are ridiculous. The, the, um, the uh, sorry, the Microsoft apps, the Adobe apps, things like, I think it's called Umake, where you can spin around 3D objects that you're creating. Right. Um, there is the issue of whether Apple can create an environment that is sustainable for software of that caliber if you're not Adobe and you're not Microsoft. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's an absolutely serious issue that they need, to, they need to put time and attention and a dedicated VP of App Store uh, behind uh, to, to solve that problem. But uh, the device itself is, is great. And it looks really big, but because a lot of that space is taken up by the speaker caverns, if that's the proper technical word, uh, it's really not as heavy as it looks, if that makes sense. Whew. All right, so we're working our way through this event. There's so much. There was so much, Renee. There was so much announced. It was a little bit crazy. All right, so after that, we had Eddie Q come out in his Product Red shirt, and he showed us uh, – it was Product Red, not Ensign Red, in case you were worried about Eddie's safety during the event. Uh, <laughs> He came out, and we we got a chance, and I'm going to borrow a finally from Serenity here, to see the Apple TV 4, the, or they're calling it the new yes. Apple TV. They also a do call it the fourth generation Apple TV, so as we don't have to just refer to it as the new Apple TV everywhere. <laughs> Every <laughs> year. IPad. Um, yeah, it's not Apple A5. I mean, some people were concerned that it's an Apple A8 processor, not an A9 processor like the new iPads and iPhones are, are getting, but it's only pushing 1080p. Uh, video and that also caused some people some concern because you know 4k is a hot buzzword but the feeling is that 4k is just not present enough not enough people have 4k television sets I believe it's still single digit there's Netflix 4k but very few sources provide 4k video and even then there's a debate between UHD and 4k and whether it's going to have HDR or not have HDR and a lot of people don't have the bandwidth for sustained 4k so personally as a geek I would have loved to see 4k on this but I had myself set up to not get it so I wasn't terribly disappointed um, some people have argued that since the iPhone, and we'll get to that in a minute, can shoot 4K, it should be on the TV. But I get the feeling the iPhone is positioned more like you have all these pixels if you want to zoom in or you want to down, down sample and get really, really good you know, 1080p or just show it up on YouTube or you know, those sorts of things. And this, this box was not about, as strange as it seems, it was not about the video signal. It was about the apps. Apps everywhere. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, exactly. App the the future of television. 
television is apps to quote Tim Cook. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the 4K signal, or lack thereof, I really do think that we are on the cusp of 4K being affordable and reasonable for everybody, but we're not quite there yet. Um, and as a result, I think it's a little bit hard to have the reasoning of, yes, we're going to put in a chip that allows that allows playback of 4K video, um, which might require bumping the, like, the Apple TV right now, I think, is very nicely and competitively priced, where you've got, what, $169 and $200 um, or is it 149? I can't remember off the top of my head. But uh, either way, you've got reasonably, you know, mid mid 100s here to high 100s. Mm -hmm. um, if you had to add in another 50 dollars to cover 4K video, that then you start becoming a 200 and 250 dollar set top box, which I feel like some pe people would still pay for, but it's kind of on the edge of necessity. I, I can see 4K coming. Like console the, price. Exactly. I can see 4K coming a year down the line. Uh, but no, the, uh, the the keystone features of this Apple TV announcement were really about Siri and about apps, about how Siri is going to help you control your living room, but doesn't involve calling it out into the echo, you know, into the wilderness. There's no always on listening Siri in the background. You have to use a button to call it. Um, and the apps, and you've got so many different um app options, even just from the the programs that were demoed on stage. Uh, but this this opens up a huge opportunity for us who are making games, who are making shopping things, who are making pretty much anything that would would fit nicely on a TV. Although we should note, no WebKit. So people who want to make virtual web browsers on your television, eh, sorry. Yeah, so just like it's the still, Apple Watch. on iOS. All the WebKit and other, like, so basically the entire, and this is a, a good a thing worth pointing out, the the watch, the Apple TV, the iPhone, and the iPad all run full-blown iOS. It's, they, they always have, at least since 2010, they always have. But for the watch and the Apple TV, Apple goes through and removes the headers from a bunch of the frameworks. So that basically makes them private APIs. They cannot be accessed by developers. And that's the case for WebKit on the watch and on the TV. On the watch, it makes sense, because Web, WebKit is a pretty big framework, and loading it up on the watch, you know, it's suboptimal for devices that battery constrained and that screen constrained. On the TV, it's more interesting because some people probably would have given their druthers like a TV browser um, on the Apple TV, but at the same time, it might it might make them more aligned to make quick little apps. You can already do the JSON apps, which is what traditional Apple TV apps are, but just throwing in a web view and pumping in your existing website might be too tempting, and Apple might be trying to force them towards native apps. So that's the only rationale that makes sense to me, unless they just, you know, they have an angry, angry bug about the web. No, I agree. Uh, what do you, so, Ren, you wrote about this extensively. There was some brouhaha about the initial 200 megabyte download size for Apple Store apps. There was. So um, if you're getting an app on the Apple TV or you're making an app for the Apple TV, uh, you're required to use what's called on-demand resources. Now, this isn't new. This is something that's coming in iOS 9, too, for your iPhone and your iPad. Uh, but what it basically says on the Apple TV is your initial app bundle, your initial download, has to be 200 megabytes or less, um, or you can't upload it to the App Store. That doesn't mean that your app in total has to be 200 megs, however. Your app in total um, can be up to 20 gigabytes, which is a lot. Uh, you just have to slice it into specific, you have to slice it into sort of these bite-sized download chunks called tags. Uh, so that when you download the app, you get that 200 megabyte bundle. You can get two gigabytes more immediately upon install. So you have a, an app that's 2.2 gigabytes. And then as you need new content or as you need to sort of switch out stuff that's not immediately in the foreground, you can pull up to 20 gig gigabytes more off of the server. So you have, you know, you have a much bigger app, uh, potential app size as possible, but without all of the, all of the necessity of making a user download four gigabytes of a game when they may only ever play, you know, 500 megabytes of levels. Um, and of course, that's that. Some people are understandably up in arms about this. Um, this does this does make this this makes app developers have to think a bit more creative creatively, and it also means that streaming services may not be able to download offline a lot of offline content because you have to sort of make it ready in that 20 gigabyte bundle. So there's there's some stuff here and there about how that might that might be a little bit of an issue. But the 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 real thing is that a lot of people were freaking out that 200 at the 200 
megabyte number and saying, oh no, my apps can only be 200 megabytes? Uh, this, this is just going to be a toy. Apple, Apple can't make real games with 200 megabytes, and, and good news. Developers do not. Yeah, so you, but my, you can make a very good game with 2.2 gigabytes. My understanding is that this is designed to solve the problem of small devices in general. So like, if you have a 32 gigabyte Apple TV and you've got 32, you've got 30 gigabytes on it and you were going to download a traditional app, which can be four gigabytes in size, you would just get an error saying you're out of space, go delete something. And they don't ever want that to happen on a television. They don't want you having to go in and remove apps. It, they just don't want that experience to exist. So what happens is if you're not under pressure, if you have lots of space, it downloads the 200 megabytes and then just keeps downloading the, the two gigabytes and whatever else you need. But if you're under storage constraint, it downloads the 200 megabytes, then starts deleting other content, like the, the extra level, like the oldest levels you've played on other games and things you haven't touched in a while. And that frees up space as it's downloading the next, uh, um, what is it, 20 gigabyte, two gigabyte slice, I think is the first one. Uh, and then it keeps doing that, it deletes older content, adds new content, and sort of tries to intelligently manage it. Also that we don't have to, like on Apple TV, oh, I'm going to delete this game, wiggly mode, delete, next game, wiggly mode, delete, oh, still not enough, wiggly mode, delete. It wants to manage all of that for us. And so, George, I don't, I, it feels like one of those things where Apple wants to make our lives less stressful, but in so doing are going to make developers' lives more stressful. Yeah, I, Apple always thinks about the user experience. I think it's a very smart strategy. I think that people look at like the small number, and they they did think that, as Serenity had mentioned, that that was the as large as the game could be, which is stressful. I think that it is going to put another constraint on developers because they're going to have to figure out how they're going to be able to manage this and what are people going to use and what they're not going to use. But in the end, I think that the user experience is going to be better, and a lot of people don't understand why they are out of memory. I have people come up to me all the time even wondering on their phone and they're deleting things that they shouldn't be deleting like applications that are using up almost nothing in comparison to long videos that they could get rid of one that they're staring at their feet the entire time to be able to get back memory so it makes it a real mess so I think that people are a little bit up in arms which we can often be we often react first and then think about it later but I think that we're gonna win out on the user experience on using our TV and the thought of having like space constraints on when you're watching TV playing games and doing other things would be a nightmare so I think that this is the better of the two decisions that Apple had to make. Now there is, as long as, as far as I understand, like this, this number is is involved in ongoing discussions. Like some people at Apple wish it was higher, and some people at Apple like it the way it is, and it might change. But I think it is hardest for people who use things like the Unreal Engine or um, what's the other big one? It starts with a uh, U that I keep forgetting. Um, Unre Unreal, maybe. Uh, is that it? I that forget. That was the one that you said, yeah. Unre oh, see, this is what happens when I travel. Uh, <laughs> Unreal or um, Epic. Is that the same one? Is Epic still Unreal? I'm doing this really badly today. Unity. That was the one I was trying to think of. Sorry. You got um, it. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah, so using those, those engines can be huge on their own, and you can't really download these. But I think, Serenity, you mentioned you can download like a splash screen, 200 megabytes, and then download your engine, and then download your level. So uh, it... it it, it might not be workable for some people and they'll have to push back on Apple and Apple will hopefully improve it. But it, it's like one of those things where I like where the technology is going. They may not have nailed it immediately, but I think that this idea is good. And if it gets tweaked so that everybody is happier, maybe not happy, but happier, then we all benefit because mm -hmm. if you, uh, I've had, you know, 32 gigabyte iPhones that I've hit up against the limit of, and I've had to manage those and things. And so I bought 128 and then I never got near that. And now I'm buying 64. And if I didn't have to worry about that so much, if more of it was like iCloud photo library and iCloud music library and was doing this near line on demand sort of thing, I, I would be so much happier. So am I the only one that's really excited about the remote? No, tell me. No, I'm so, I'm so excited about the remote. I think that it's amazing. I love the fact that it's going to have the glass touch service, and so I surface, so I'm going to be able to choose to swipe if I want. I love that it has an accelerometer and gyroscope if I want to. I'm going to be able to play games using this remote. I'm not sure how that experience is going to be because it doesn't come with the wrist strap, and it's going to be really expensive. Mm -hmm. So the chances of me throwing the remote into the TV screen are relatively great. I play in a very poor way. But I also love the fact that it's three months of a charge, which is phenomenal. That's great. Mm -hmm. It still doesn't have the uh, find your remote issue. I, you know, I'll ask Apple for that. I, I don't know why. I feel like find your, find my remote would be so easy to incorporate into this yes. little thing. Put it in your watch, right? Solve <laughs> yes. Years. 
yes. years, years of, years of time. Exactly, exactly. But I think that there is, I think it's going to be amazing. I think it's really going to change because remotes are, are a hated creature among everyone. And I really love the idea. Yeah, having the touch surface, I think, is going to change a lot. And being able to talk through Siri. And, and for me, I know, Renee, you were talking about people that um, might have mobility issues. Having to press a button might be a difficulty with um, talking to Siri to your television set through pressing a button. But I love the fact that I have that as a security measure so that it's not always on and listening to everything I say in my living room. Or singing, like just picking up all your singing and broadcasting without your knowledge. What, yeah, right. what shall or we keep for blackmail against Georgia today? <laughs> Right, or having my kids change the, the TV show without me wanting them to. Well, I got a chance to try this. It, it really is fantastic. You say, like, show me a comedy. Show me a, show me an episode where Serenity Caldwell guest starred. Uh, what it, <laughs> or my favorite, like, what did, what, did, what did she say? And it goes back and then shows yes. it to you with subtitles, which is just super awesome. Yeah, with subtitles. I will, I will use that all the time. Because oh, I'm often, like, doing something else. I'm like, wait a second. Was that what I think that happened? And then when you say, what did she say, you missed what they said then. Yep, yep. <laughs> And then everyone's angry at you. Uh, so you can only have one Apple remote uh, connected right now. I don't know if that's going to change over time. But if you want additional controllers, you have to use your iOS device or you can buy made, uh, made for iPhone controllers. And those are cool because they can control the entire interface as well. So you can have your gamepad and still control everything. But you don't have to worry about people with multiple Siri buttons trying to claim dominance of the living room. <laughs> no, we're just still fighting over that yeah, one remote. <laughs> Uh, Give it but, to me. I do like that the remote also controls your television. Uh, yes. That's really awesome to me to turn on and on off in volume. Right. Uh, those are two very and and automatic switch to input. I hate using multiple remotes. Yes, I really me do. Too. I have a harm getting that. You know. Yeah. yeah. Where's the other one? No, the volume's on the other remote. <sighs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, so as yeah. long as your TV supports HDMI 1.4. Um, it's fine. I, we, we didn't talk about this with the iPad, so I'll bring it up again in context of pricing. And Serenity mentioned that here too, like this is a $149 and $199 box. If it was using an Apple A6, sorry, an A9 chipset, if it had other things in it, it'd be a more expensive box. And then mm -hmm. I don't know if it's worth it. The, the iPad Pro, it starts at $799 and you can't get LTE unless you go with the even more expensive version. And then I think it's 32 gigs and 128 gigs. So I, I do wish there were more SKUs there. Like I wish LTE was just on everything. And I don't know if what it would be the right one, like 32, 128, are we ready for 256 yet? I'm not sure. But I do feel like there's not enough iPad Pros. I'm alone there. <laughs> All right, so we're going to take one last commercial break, and then we're going to talk iPhones. So I want to let you know all about lynda.com. Actually, lynda.com would be killer on an iPad Pro, and they already support iPad apps. So it's just, I mean, the iPad Pro is just iPad apps with even more potential room for more great stuff. So this episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash iMore. Lynda is for problem solvers, for the curious for people who want to make things happen. If you want to master Excel, learn negotiating tactics, build a website, build your Photoshop skills, go to lynda.com and feed your curious mind. I am sure that within days, if not weeks, of all these new apps being released for the iPad Pro, lynda.com will tell you exactly how to get the most out of them. They have courses like Excelling at Excel, Going Paperless, iPhone and iPad Security, Growth hacking, I, almost anything you could think of. I've been looking at their photography courses lately because I want to. I'm still having trouble in certain, especially low light situations, and I want to get better at it. And that's the super cool thing is you can watch an entire course if you know nothing about it. But if you already have the basics, you can just hunt down the couple questions that you have and watch those segments and get the answers that you need right away. It is on demand. It's not on demand resources. On demand learning. It's fantastic. You can watch and learn from top experts who are passionate about teaching. Stream thousands of video courses on demand. Learn at your own schedule your own pace. You can watch as a little bite-sized piece or the entire thing. You can browse transcripts. Uh, you can take notes. You can download the apps for iOS, for Android. You can download tutorials. You can create and save playlists. The, every feature you could possibly want, Linda has thought of it and provided it for you. So here's what I want you to do. Your lynda.com membership will give you unlimited access to training on I'm sorry, on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an industry expert, you're passionate about your hobby, or you just want to learn something new, I want you to go to lynda.com slash iMore and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash iMore, I-M-O-R-E. God, I hope I spelled that right.
<laughs> All right. I think you're fun. okay. <laughs> so it is an S year, and S years typically mean that they keep the same design, but they add uh, extra features. One year we got you know a better chipset for iPhone 3GS speed. Then we got Siri for iPhone 4S, and then we got the sensor for the iPhone 5S, the Touch ID sensor. This year Apple came out, and I, I'm always tempted to say that by themselves, no feature is incredibly compelling, but taken in whole, they're compelling. But this year, I feel like a couple of the features are really, really cool. Did you have any favorites, Ren? Oh, gosh. Uh, 3D Touch is a highlight for me. Uh, I think that it was done in a very natural, very expressive way. And it is it supports multi-touch input for, for fingers as well, which yes. is huge, which won't provide necessarily the level of sensitivity from using an... Apple Pencil on an iPad Pro, but still gives stylus makers and uh, artists on an iPhone so much more to work with. Uh, so that's my that's my sort of keynote is the three D touch feature is just blockbuster. It Could was change. so well thought out. Like they've been working on this for a long time, and they wanted to solve two primary problems. The iPhone only has one column. It's not like an iPad where you can have like a column of messages and the contents of the message, and then you just tap through the column to find the message you want really quickly. This is tap, slide all the way over, wrong one, back button, tap again, slide. It's just not fast. And also, as the screens got bigger, they became harder to use one-handed. But the thing is, you don't have to solve for one-handed use only by screen size. There's all sorts of other things you can do. And this is the culmination of that. So you have both the ability, and it's still not quite as fast as a multi-column layout, but you can just, you have three states, hint, peak, and pop. When you touch a little bit, it'll show you, everything else will blur out, and you'll see that this message is available for preview. Then you press a little bit, and it pops up into this, well, I won't say pop, because it's a name for something else, but it, it comes up into this peak view, which is basically a preview. And that shows you the contents of the message, or the web page, or the map, or, or anything else you can think of. And then if it's the one you want, you can just press a little bit harder, and it pops you right into that app, or into that screen. And if you if it's not the right one, you just release pressure, and you go right back to that list. And it makes it, it's like an accelerator. It makes it so much faster. And then for app icons, you can have both static and dynamic uh, shortcuts. So you can touch the messages icon, for example, and new messages already is always there, but it knows the last three people I've messaged. So we can have Georgia, Serenity, uh, and Kevin, for example, in that list. You can have, you know, um, I think up to four items, two lines of text per item, and an icon in any one of those things. And you just pull down, swipe over, tap them, and you're there. So you're launching actions, not apps anymore. You're going, you're avoiding going to the app, going to the feature. It just, Georgia, it makes using an iPhone so, you can swipe, force swipe to get right into the, the, the fast app switcher. So you have the back, you can have like the normal swipe to go back pages, and then the force swipe to go back apps. It's super clever. So cool. So I think cool. It's, I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant because just as pinch to zoom became, it's it's so intuitive. It makes sense. This is exactly the same thing. It makes sense for us to be able to press down, to be able to open something, and press down further to go right into it. And so because of that, I think that we're, it's going to save us time. I think that it's not every new feature that you're going to have to relearn something. It, it's going to take a little bit of an adoption time. But because it makes so much sense of the way that we already interact with things, I think that this is going to make people feel, I think one is it's actually a feature for getting the, the S, which is big for Apple. Because why upgrade when the phone, even though every real, really almost everything about it is different, even the outer casing is different, because it looks the same, people say, well, it's the same phone. And so this distinguishes it. And it's just such a nice usability feature to save us time and effort and stress. There's so many times that I look through a message and I can't, I want to see how important it is. And so now I'm going to have to open it up. It's all going to launch. It's stressing me out. And so I just don't do it. Or I launch it and then when I close it, I haven't said that I've unread it. And then I forget about it, and then I might go back, and I've actually missed out on something that was vastly important. So I think that it's not just going to save time. I think it's going to lower our stress levels when we use our phone. Yeah, it, it looks, and the feeling too, like the amount of, they've, they've got a whole new hap, uh, taptic engine in the middle of the phone, and when you press on it, even if it's if there's no options, you still get like a little bit of pressure, almost like the, the um the login dialog that shakes its head when you get it wrong is a little bit of delightful interaction, so it makes you want to try other other buttons, and it's really great for discoverability. I was super happy with that. 
Uh, the camera looks great. Like the traditional problem with going to higher megapixels is cutting up the sensor to making smaller pixels that then suck in less light and that creates more noise. And what Apple did, and Serenity, I wish the Death Star had had this because it would still be here. It's got <laughs> deep trench isolation. Wait a second. Are you, are you saying plus one for the Death Star? Well, I mean, like, it just it, it feels like that was such a, an easy problem to solve, right? Like all they had to oh, do was Renee. a little deep trench isolation. Oh, BB-8 is, is judging you. Uh, that's all right. Um, Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm, I'm looking for a moth hood. Side note. Oh, oh, that's devastating. <laughs> Look behind me. Look, what do you see, Serenity? Just wall. No, no BB-8 yet. Yeah, just still in UPS is holding it hostage until they get their, oh. their payment. Their I have my people. second one here. <laughs> oh, no. Don't even. Don't really. Okay, my heart I want to. I want to get rid of him. I want to send him to <gasps> someone else who is deserving. <laughs> Because gonna... I have one. I don't need two. I accidentally got two. So I, I, I want to... I have no BB-8. I've been waiting. Set him free. I know. We'll, we'll get <laughs> you your so BB-8. <laughs> yes, it will happen. Anyway, yes, uh, deep, deep trench isolation, um, allowing the iPhone 6S and 6S Plus sensor to shoot 12 megapixel photos, which is really exciting. The photos still look great. The low light... Uh, low light looks even better and we've got a new a new gimmick in the photos and uh, camera apps called live photos and yes Nokia did invent that in 1812 that's fine um, <laughs> a a a Apple is making a little so the live photo you get 1.5 seconds before and after that animates run is that right yes that's correct so when you open up the camera app uh, before you press the take photo button, it's actually snapping a series of shots um, as you're getting ready. And so when you record that photo, when you do actually snap it, and then you go to the Photos app to look at it, you can actually force press on our 3D press on a photo, and it will show you the few frames before and the few frames after, and it makes it look like a little Harry Potter photo, sort of a little floating but I, as my friend Allie was joking, and I, I agree with her. I feel like all of my my self photos now are going to be like <laughs> <laughs> blinking, blinking before you need to take yeah. the shot. Some of them you won't yeah. want to have. Uh, Renee, no. I, know, I know. Yeah, <laughs> Renee, I know a lot of people are upset over the security measures because they're saying, well, now Apple's constantly listening in and like taking video without your knowledge of your pictures. Nobody you, is upset. CBS, who cannot read a technical description <laughs> upset no he well i'm sure they've managed to make people upset like the, so the, the the thing is this you can enable hey siri if you want to to be like previously you had to be plugged in to do it and you could turn it on now with an iphone 6s or 6 plus you no longer have to be plugged in you can do hey siri anytime but apple makes you say hey siri as part of the setup if you want to use it and then it tries to identify your voice and then it uses local processing uh, to do that so it's not like other services that are going to the cloud to try to figure out if it's you or not it's it the it's just a dead device. Like a, you could be an on, a completely disconnected device on there waiting for Hey Siri. There's nothing being stored or transmitted. Same for live photos. A digital camera works by continuously capturing images, and then when you press the button, it stores that image. This is doing nothing different. It's just got a bigger buffer, and when you press the button, it stores 1.5 seconds of that previous buffer. All of this is incredibly easy to understand if you just are, you know, look at the technology as being as Apple has presented it. But I guess headlines, right? And also, everything can be turned off. Yes. If you don't want Hey Siri, it can be turned off. If you don't want uh, live photos, it can be turned off. And then you can have whatever you like and not worry about privacy implications. Right. And it's it's re it's reusing that space so you don't have to worry. It's not like it's going to anywhere else. It's just you already have your photos stored on your phone in the first place and your videos, if you choose to have this, you're just going to have more. It's not going anywhere else. But I think that a lot of people don't understand the manner in which technology uses works. And I think that it is important for us to explain so that people can understand what's happening versus what's not, what is a security risk, and what wouldn't be. So I am happy that people ask the question to it so that they can get a form informed. I think that other companies have done it in a way that was less than transparent and less than private. And I think Apple, I think it's right to ask those questions, but we're asking those questions because it's been done badly in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple other questions coming in. Um, we've answered how is 3D Dutch. We've answered the 4K question. H how would you choose now, Ren? If you were trying to choose a new ultra portable and you were looking at the MacBook or the iPad Pro, what, what would send you one direction or the other?
Uh, say that. Say that again. You froze during the end of that. Sorry. So if you had to choose, like, how would you decide between a 12-inch uh, MacBook and a 12-inch iPad Pro? That's a really tough uh, decision. I would say uh, not having spent a lot of time with the iPad Pro, and really I need to spend more before I'd give a concrete answer. Uh, depends on what you're doing it for. If you're, if writing is a big thing, writing and computer gaming and just anything that requires extensive tools, um, multi, like extensive multitasking, you might want to continue sticking with Mac OS X. If you think that you can work in a little bit more single stream, if you can just have two apps open at once, uh, if you don't need to write as often as you do need to physically touch a canvas, the iPad is probably for you. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Uh, we're getting this question a lot, so I'll answer this yet again. Why didn't Apple go for 32 gigabytes as the base model? Why is there a 16 gigabyte phone with 4K video? It makes the entire phone utterly useless. So uh, we're going to talk about more of this on Vector, but there is an incredible lack of perspective taking in technology today. Whether you're reviewing a MacBook and you say that it doesn't have enough ports, you can get a MacBook Pro, but that computer might suit somebody else. The 16 gigabyte iPhone, it suits a lot of people. I was talking about this earlier. Georgia, how many gigabytes has your husband used on his iPhone? Only nine. So he would be perfectly fine with a 16 gigabyte. My mom has barely used any space on hers. Her next iPhone is probably going to be a 16 gigabyte iPhone. Mm -hmm. And I dislike the tech industry calling her stupid. There's also a bunch of people in enterprise and in schools who are buying thousands of these things. And all they want to do is use business to business apps and web portals. And getting a low cost iPhone uh, is the most important thing. Yes, Apple could go down to 32 gigabytes for them, but that starts messing up. Apple's entire business is based on the average selling price of an iPhone. And if that goes down, mm -hmm. Wall Street starts dumping their stock. So as a business, they have a duty to maximize profits. But they've done everything from those on-demand resources to the asset splitting to make 16 gigabytes work well for people for whom that's just the, as much as they want or as much as they can afford. Given the price plans now, though, I mean, it's, it's not that much more money. So nobody has to buy the 16 gigabyte iPhone. You can buy the last generation at, at a higher bandwidth, I believe now. Um, especially secondhand, like not a new last generation, but you can buy, there's all sorts of ways to get the iPhone that you want. Uh, this existing is just a reflection of the differences in NAND style and pricing, along with making, it's like the same reason the, two, the iPad 2 stayed around for so long, having that low price mm -hmm. model for a certain customer. So it, yeah. it exists, but you don't have to buy it. Well, there's a lot of people that really use their iPhone for a phone and for surfing the web and maybe having a game. And so they're not going to use up a lot of uh, gigs on their iPhone because of that. And so this would be the perfect phone for them. Yeah, and that, again, that's not a defense of Apple. You can you can think it's a stupid phone and not buy it, but it, it, you can't think that it's stupid for everybody. I mean, well, some they people do have a like lot of phone. choice. Yeah, they do have yeah. still a lot of choice. And some people, like if I was getting an, and I would like to get my mom. You know, I usually give her. She's looking to get a, a new phone, and so I'd want to give her something that's easy to use, like an Apple phone. But she wouldn't need much memory. She would truly be using that for the phone and maybe answering email and maybe searching the web every now and then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so perspective taking people. Not every not every device has to be for you. It can be for other people. Um, can you use this is from Capture to Cran. Can you use the Apple Pencil on all your iOS devices, Ren? You cannot. You can only use it on the iPad Pro, and that has to do with the refresh rate of the screen. The iPad Pro's refresh rate is currently 240 hertz, as opposed to, I believe, 120 on the iPad Air 2, and 64 on the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. I don't know about what the refresh rate is on the 6S, but regardless, uh, the pencil is designed primarily for the iPad Pro. Could we see it expand in the future? Possibly, but I don't think so. Yeah, it, I could maybe see it working on the air, but I think on an iPhone, I'd love it. Like, I believe me, I would love it everywhere, but uh, baby steps. Um, do you think we'll see Apple's phone switch app hit the App Store on the 16th, or when do we think? So Apple's making an app called Move, but it's actually not an iOS app. It's an Android app. It's going to be on the Google Play Store on uh, this, not the 16th, but when the iPhone 6S and 6S uh, Plus launch. I think that's the 25th. And it's, it's built into the iPhone startup screen. So when you're doing the startup, do you want to use Siri? Do you want to use location services? You'll have an option if you're switching from Android to get that utility running on your iPhone and then the app running on Android. And it'll suck over all your data and then show you where all, like help you download all the apps that you have on Android onto your iPhone. So I, as far as I know, we don't need it on the App Store. It's going to be built in. That's my understanding, at least. 
All right, so uh, Georgia, any final thoughts? Anything else about the event that stood out to you? I mean, we don't have One Direction to sing us out. I'm sorry, One Republic to sing us out. Keep doing that. So uh, what do you think? You're muted. Oh, no. Georgia. OK, OK, I'm back. I'm back. It, it was, I'm not going to, I said some amazing stuff there, but I'm not going to, no, I'm not going to repeat it. Um, uh, I'm just, uh, the other thing I'm really excited about is rose gold. I think that it's stunning looking. I think that it suits everyone. And so I, I think that's just the color to beat now. I ordered it, 32 gigabyte iPhone 6 plus rose gold. Beautiful. Yeah. I thought about it, but I went, I went space black. I went back to my roots. Space I, yeah, gray, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't blame you. Like it's, it's gonna, it. I just like, I feel like we need the new one, like the new color, so that when we have the photographs and we have all the pictures and stuff and the videos, you can tell that it's an I. It's almost like proof of work. It's new. Yeah. I think it's also the bragging rights, Renee. You can go around and everyone knows. I'll know, just put a hot pick song. case on anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think you about got people asking around the Touch ID button? <laughs> That's true. What about people who ask for uh, black faces on the white, on the uh, rose gold and uh, gold phones. I Ooh. want it. I, I want it so great. much. I think that would look great. Yeah. Well, I just so really understand and that. Gold. Mm -hmm. This feels very Bruins. Black and yellow, black and yellow. Yeah. No, it works. You know what? It works. I have a feeling that, I, I mean, I think Apple's discovered that especially on the S years, introducing new colors increases the excitement because we discussed this before. Humans are superficial creatures. Scratch our surface, Georgia. More surface. We More want surface. something new. Yeah, so I could see like next, like in the like iPhone 7S having black and gold or, you know, blue or, or some other color to make it unique again. Yes, they, and they sell a lot. Yeah. We, we just, we love to be able to, it's, it's a status symbol, you know. For the good and for the bad, it's a stand, mm -hmm. but sad symbol, and everyone does notice. People come up to me all the time saying, is that the watch, blah, 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 what is going? The first, you know, rose gold Apple watch that I see in the wild, I am going to be, let me take a look. Yes, that looks amazing. And then she's going to run with it. <laughs> <laughs> More cardio. Uh, yeah, no, so how was your ordering process, Ren? Um, unmuted. Uh, the ordering process was was really seamless, aside from the fact that I hate waking up at three in the morning. Um, but I went through the Apple Store app, like I have the last three years, and that is that is the best way to order. Um, I was in three minutes after uh, 3 a.m. I tapped the version that I wanted. They had an option for reserve in store, which I happily checked because I hate waiting around for UPS. So I'm going to get my and and this year which is, I think, a first, they have specific time slots when you're supposed to come in and get your yeah. phone. Cool. That's great. Actually, we had that last I, year. We don't have that this year. I'm sad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we all of the have... goodness has gone from Canada to the U.S. Where it <laughs> oh, well. I blame Serenity because she's of both borders, so wherever she goes, the goodness goes. Uh, it's yeah. True. It's I, uh, what did you, did you get? 30, uh, sorry, 64 or 128? 64, 64 yeah, space gray, six plus this year. I'm gonna oh, try it for snap. a year. Good for yeah. oh, you. Gonna love it. Serenity, I'm, love so it. So here's my thing. I would not have even considered the six plus until I got the Apple Watch. Right. The Apple Watch makes it a little bit more feasible, and also especially with 3D touch um, and with pressure sensitivity and a couple other things. I really want to play with the big. Like I want to. I want a chance to play with the bigger screen. Now, my boyfriend has a 6 Plus, and I'm not super enamored of his, so we'll see. I, it may be a huge mistake, and I may go back to my 6 within two weeks. But we'll right. See. The only the only thing is I would say to get, like, a love handle or, like, the no biggie uh, <laughs> so that you can hold on to your phone one-handed, and it doesn't fall down and slip, and you can it's, it does increase the usability to that. Yeah. I just totally went to the killing there, Georgia. Oh, snap, Lyndon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't know, I didn't know you got the 6 Plus. This is going to be awesome. Because at worst, you're going to have it for a week before you decide to change it. So it would be a nice insight to see. Yeah, this, this is also true. You and kind of need a, the two weeks, though. You know that you need the two weeks of the growth period oh, of changing. So give it some thought. The testing. I understand. <laughs> yeah. I understand. And you still got the – so that's – it's optical I, image stabilization and optical movie stabilization only on the 6 Plus – sorry, the 6S Plus still. So I'm looking forward to that, too. Yeah. All the 4K videos. Oh, so many. So much 4K. Okay. All right, Georgia. So, is people... that our last question? Uh, yeah, that was our last question. Well, the other ones uh, we've already answered, so I'm just I'm triaging as we go, because we're at about an hour. 
Georgia, if people want to yeah. find you on the internet, if they want to find out more about you, if they want to find your awesome videos, where can they go? Uh, if you're dealing with anxiety or someone you love is and want to treat it at home, you can check out anxiety-videos.com and you can check me out on Twitter at Georgia underscore Dow. And of course, I'm more. Will this help me get through iPhone crazy review season? It might. You'd have to actually follow the, the different um, techniques that are in there, which one might be, you know, take a little bit more time. You're supposed to say yes. We're trying to sell your videos. Oh, sorry. Yes, Renee. All right. Awesome. <laughs> How about you, Ren? Where are you these days? Yep. Where can they find you, Ren? Oh, uh, they can find me at S-E-T-T-E-R-N, Saturn on Instagram and Twitter, and on imore.com every day, and occasionally on The Incomparable. Awesome. Yes, we, 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 we met with the Jason Snell and recorded a little bit of the Clockwise. It was a lot of fun. So check that out yeah, if you haven't. Fun. We also did a, I did a twit last night with Ben Thompson uh, and uh, Ed Bott, super smart guys. So we can get more reaction about the event there. And you can find me at Renee Ritchie. You can find all of us at iMore. If you go to iTunes, please subscribe. Please leave a review. It helps other people learn about the show. Um, and that's just great for everybody. If you missed the video and you really want to watch the video, you can go to youtube.com slash imorevideo. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us here today. We are going to have so much, so much, I almost crying when I said that, so much coverage coming your way this week and next. All the coverage, Ren. All the coverage. None more coverage. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Do it all.